just to start um, with a, a definition from a more of a regulatory perspective is that um, this clinical research is a systematic investigation, um, including development, testing, and evaluation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. And the things that I wanted to point out in this definition um, are, number one, that it is systematic. So when you're talking about doing a research project, um, it's, it requires some forethought, right, and some planning. You've got a hypothesis. You're, you're going to review the literature, um, you know, look for, you know, things to support the reasons why you're doing your research, um, come up with criteria for your protocol, what kind of patients you want to enroll, even if you're doing retrospective research, specifically what patient population do you want to look at that would help you answer your question. Um, and the next aspect of that is that it contributes to generalizable knowledge. So really what this means is that that separates research from your standard care medical practice. Um, when you're in, you know, in clinic, you're looking at the patient who's right there in front of you, um, how you can treat that individual patient. When you're thinking about a research project, you're looking at, as I said, a group of pop patients, a patient population, and um, treating individual patients is not the, really the focus of a research project. I mean, ultimately, you know, yes, you want to improve um, patient care, but really you're looking at a, um, a larger a larger issue. And so for clinical investigators, this is sometimes a difficult, a difficult challenge. I mean, a kind of a balance between, um, you know, your usual, your standard medical care as a medical provider versus a investigator. Um, and beyond just the, uh, the scope of treating an individual patient versus treating a patient population, what works better in a population, say, of glaucoma patients as opposed to this specific patient in the chair in front of you, um, it changes your relationship with, with that patient. And I think that's the significant part that, that clinicians often have a difficult time dealing with um, because as a clinician, the patient comes to you for your expertise, of course, for you to tell them what you feel is best for them. Um, but when you're in a research investigation, you're really partnering with that patient, right? You're asking them to help you participate in your research, to, you know, to share you know, their information or, with you for this larger question that you have in mind. And so um, when we talk about regulatory uh, um, requirements for research, it's really because of this different different relationship that you have with this patient now when they're a participant in your research study versus the patient in the clinic. Um, so to be, before I get into, so it's a little bit about what research is just in very general terms, but just off the top I'll, I'll eliminate some things that research is not in, from a regulatory perspective. Um, quality control. Uh, for example, we've certainly seen research projects um, come through. Uh, our area, for example, I think it was Brian Stagg who did one looking at um, uh, fellowship programs or, or you know residency programs. Um, has sent out a survey to to other programs outside of Utah, asking specific questions about um, how their programs were structured and um, looking at different you know satisfaction with you know certain aspects or um, part of the curriculum. Really, the IRB didn't consider that research per se. Um, or clinical research. I mean, certainly it's a type of research, but it really was kind of aimed at, you know, improving a process. Um, in surgery, they do QA projects all the time. You know, how do they improve their, their, their instrument sterilization or their processing or something? So that's not really considered clinical research. Case reports, the common question. Um, a lot of you will probably be publishing case reports. Um, and really the IRB, it seems a little random, but they have defined um, a case series of three or fewer patients as not requiring regulatory oversight from an IRB. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple of case reports you can go ahead and publish and um, not really couch that as research. If you have any questions anytime, just holler around. <laughs> um, another t a topic that is not considered research, and it's kind of a, um, hi Renee, um, a gray area is off-label use. Um, this is strictly defined as using a medication or device within the practice of medicine. 
um, and it, but you're using it in a way that deviates from its FDA product labeling. And if you've ever had the pleasure of reading um, a drug, or especially a drug package insert, it's really a wealth of information. Um, and it tells you not just the, you know, the condition that this product is approved to treat, but the patients that um, have been studied, what their adverse events were. Essentially gives you all of the data from the phase three clinical trials that went into, and the preclinical information that went into getting this product FDA approved. So, um, you know, and, the FDA realizes that um, labeling can't address every situation that comes up in clinical care. So, you know, off-label use, um, it's, it's legal, it's very common, um, and I think, you know, the caution is that the, the, the farther you deviate from the approved uses, the more risk you run when you're using things off-label. Um, specifically, you don't know risks and benefits as well as you would in that approved patient population. Um, there is no uh, regulatory requirement um, from a research perspective for off-label use, but in conversations that I've had over the years with risk management here at the university, they really do suggest that you do a thorough informed consent process with your patients. Um, and Again, you know, it depends on how far you know you're deviating from the approved use. But actually, um, on the FDA's website, there is a page for for patients as well as providers, um, and they're very, very brief. But basically, it tells the patients these are some questions you should be asking your physician if he or she mentions to you that they want to use a drug or device um, for you know your, that particular indication, and it just talks about. Um, you know, what questions you're asking, um, what are the risks, what are the possible benefits for me. So again, off-label use isn't considered research. However, it can quickly become research. Um, we've had instances, you can imagine in, during surgery, um, Dr. Crandall is constantly innovating uh, the way he does his surgeries. Um, a few years ago, he started adding I don't know, ketorolac or something into his you know, irrigating solution and um, a resident, which he can certainly, certainly do um, under the practice of medicine, and a resident came to me and said, well, we'd like to compare you know, adding the ketorolac into the, the irrigation solution with some other product, like giving, it, you know, giving the eye drops post-operatively. And at the time, there was actually uh, a pharmaceutical company doing exactly that phase three study, but when you're, when you're focused, if you go back to that one of those earlier slides when I talked about treating the patients in front of you versus a larger research question, when your focus becomes, you know, is it better or advantageous in some way or more, even more cost effective to, to put this medication into the irrigation solution versus giving it to patients in eye drops, then you've got a larger question and it does quickly become research in that regard. And um, the FDA and the IRB would require you to obtain what's called a investigational um, drug, new drug application or investigational device exemption in the case of a device um, to, to actually do that study. And what that means is they are giving you sort of their blessing to, to study this particular question um, for an indication other than which it's currently approved. So we can help with those things, but just kind of FYI, keep it in your mind. You know, when you're posing, when you're looking at your research questions, um, exactly what your scope, what your scope is. Um, and again, it's a, it's a gray area sometimes, and I think what's, uh, I hope, we can, uh, our, our research group, our clinical research administration office can help is answer those questions so that you don't um, have to wonder. You could come to us and say, do I need an IRB approval to do this project or, you know, or not, and, and we can help advise you on that. Um, but there are things, you know, within the practice of medicine that, um, you know, you, you obviously are not regulated. Um, you don't regulate surgery, surgical techniques. You can regulate the drugs you use. You can regulate the devices that you use during surgery. But um, this was just one example um, when cataract surgery, which is obviously constantly involving, but made a, a major leap forward going from doing retrobulbar uh, anesthesia for patients to, uh, to topical. And um, at the time, 
um, even though you know surgeons could certainly go ahead and do that and surgeons were doing that across the country around the world um, but Dr. Crandall um, felt it was important to actually do a research project on this and compare pain levels um, and patient compliance during surgery comparing retrobulbar injections versus topical um, and uh, Tom Burns, T.A. Burns was the anesthesiologist working at Moran at the time um, they designed these trials, we did IRB approval, and they had several publications that came out of it. So I think, you know, um, it's fine to do whatever you want to do and innovate when, you know, in your patient population, but if you want to have um, a broader impact, I mean, and that may be where some of your, your uh, motivation comes from, you want to publish, you want to, you know, change the field, um, do, a, do a research project and, instead of just, you know, innovating with your patients. And, so um, obviously, again, you know, you know what a human subject is, but um, basically a few points that are significant in this definition is that it involves a living individual um, using data from, um, from deceased individuals, using donor tissue. That is not considered human subjects research and it's not subject to IRB um, regulation. Um, obviously, when, when families uh, donate loved ones tissues they sign a lot of consent forms for that process and that includes the possibility that that tissue may be used for research if you're using information strictly from from um, decedents you don't need an IRB approval for that are there any re regulations on uh, research using donor tissue you know um, no, not in far as, not as far as the IRB is concerned um, certainly as far as the iBank is concerned but but basically, if you're using donor tissue, it would be considered a non-human subjects research project. Um, and it involves data, either through obtaining data through intervention or interaction. Um, it's sometimes a little confusing. You say, I am not going to treat a patient. Why do I need approval to do that? If they're just coming in for their standard of care visits and I'm going to collect their information. Well, that's obviously a minimal, you know, a low risk project because they're just having standard care procedures but nonetheless you are obtaining their data and probably their PHI as well um, so it, it does in, does fall into the category of a clinical research project which does you know fall under the regulations um, accordingly okay um, why is clinical research regulated I guess it's like everything else because there are people who abuse uh, privileges or um, and I think the most famous study I always have to show it even though I'm sure you're familiar with it um, just because it's so appalling every time I read these statistics um, you know just from this very start the fact that it took place this Tuskegee um, syphilis study took place over 40 years you know in the United States it wasn't something in the in the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages um, you know 1932 to 1972 um, you think we would have been fairly evolved by then socially um, that this sort of thing couldn't happen but nonetheless um, these researchers um, and it was with the uh, the national the US Public Health Service I mean it wasn't some you know some small group of, of, of researchers in a, in a lab in some obscure little town um, enrolled these 600 uh, impoverished sharecroppers most of them african-american um, comparing folks who developed syphilis versus those who did not um, and their impetus was that they received free medical care meals and burial insurance which that's kind of sad um, incentive but nonetheless um, th then then of course the you know the transgressions just get worse from there uh, they weren't told their diagnosis and they weren't treated even though penicillin was established as the standard treatment for syphilis in 1947 that group still was not treated um, hard to imagine that this that this went on but of course it did and um, that's one of the reasons why this uh, regulatory um, structure around clinical research mushroomed in the United States it sort of began with the National Research Act in 1974 enacted by Congress which established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects um, in, in a, it, part of this this act in addition to establishing this this body, this committee, um, established basic principles underlying the, contact, the conduct of human subjects research and 
required that guidelines be developed to assist investigators in complying with those principles. So the, um, the landmark sort of report that came out of that commission is what's referred to as the Belmont Report. And um, what I find interesting about that when I, you see how the regulatory structure has really mushroomed, um, and I'll show you just an example of that in a couple of slides, it's really all based on three very basic principles and they, they really are basic, um, respect for persons. Um, you know, as I mentioned, when that, you're in that relationship with a patient as a research participant versus as a patient, you're all well trained on how to, you know, how to deal with patients, um, you know, how you deal with them respectfully um, and not just in a, um, you know, informed and uh, beneficial manner. But, um, you know, obtaining informed consent is one of the probably two of two key um, areas of regulation in clinical research. So that relationship that you have with your participants, you're asking them to participate. They're under no obligation to, um, and they shouldn't be coerced to participate. Um, protecting their privacy, um, we all familiar with HIPAA, you know, you know how that ties in. Um, beneficence, um, and really that means maximizing the benefit to risk ratio when you're designing your, your research protocol. It doesn't mean that you can't put patients at risk. Um, you know, whenever we're doing a, a clinical trial and we're offering an alternative to Lucentis or ILEA for treating CNV, for example, um, you know, you, you question, you know, patients have to question, well, here's an approved treatment and we know what the results are. Why would I want to? you know, try something that's not yet quite as proven. Um, but again, you, with, with thorough informed consent, and they, by that point, you know, the investigators have, have enough data that they can say the risk is worth the potential benefit to these patients to participate in the trial. Um, and, and justice, the third principle under the Belmont Report, um, speaks to the vulnerable subject populations as um, evidenced in that uh, Tuskegee study, um, but certainly other vulnerable populations would be considered um, pregnant women and their fetuses, um, children in general, prisoners, um, you know, those with um, mental, not limited mental capacity to understand what's going on with the research. So some additional protections for them. So when I mention how the the regulatory uh, environment has mushroomed since 1974. Here's just a real, and the second page, of an, o an org chart of all the offices under the Department of Health and Human Services. And then within that office, within that department, there is an office called the Office of Human Research Protections, OHARP, and that um, reports to the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, and the the, um, the charge, the charter for this office is to, to do those things that the Belmont, that the Belmont Report and the, Nation, you know, the National um, Act in 1974 mandated in terms of provide, developing the principles and providing the guidance on, on clinical research for investigators. Um, in addition to informed consent, which I mentioned was one of the key principles underlying uh, the clinical research regulations, uh, the, what's called the common rule is the other. Um, this is found in the Code of Federal Regulations, that's what that 45 CFR is, and it talks about review of clinical research. I think you're all familiar with what an IRB is, essentially, uh, but that was really defined with this act. Um, the membership of the IRB, um, who can sit on the IRB, looking at different uh, backgrounds of the members, ensuring that they don't have any conflicts of interest with the research that they're reviewing, and um, setting out quite a lot of, of criteria that the IRB has to follow for approving a research or disapproving a research project. Um, here at the University of Utah, the IRB reports to the Associate VP for Research Integrity, who of course reports to the VP for Research. Um, the Associate VP for Research Integrity is Jeff Botkin, and I know he's going to be speaking at a Grand Rounds next month, I think. Um, and Jeff is actually sits on uh, this OHARP, and I can't really read it somewhere, 
down in here, there is a, uh, an advisory committee to the secretary, and he is currently the, uh, the chair of that committee. So he's really tied into what's happening you know, nationally with, with trends um, in regulating clinical research and providing guidance, really, um, for those regulations. Uh, the IRB, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to, to help in a, to create a project, um, their website, the IRB website, is very informative. It has guidance series. It has templates of documents that you would need. It explains what's required um, in the IRB application. And then the IRB application itself is a web-based system um, where you no longer have to you know, come up with the, the volumes of, a, of paper. Um, and it leads you, it's a Q&A. You know, you really don't even need to write a protocol in advance, although they do suggest that you, you do an outline. Um, and really, the, one of the beginning slides that I showed, talking about a systematic investigation, it lists um, all of those kind of things that you're going to want to think about that the IRB application will ask you in terms of background rationale, your patient selection criteria, your recruitment, your procedures that they're going to undergo, and how you're going to analyze the data. So this is all online, and our regulatory coordinator in my office can help you with that. Um, you will need to register real quick, registration with the IRB, as well as do some online training in human subjects research. Um, before you can submit an application to the IRB. So as I said, the, um, that the National Research Act defined the criteria that IRB uses for approval. And as I mentioned, one of the big ones was that beneficence, um, assuring that the risk to benefit ratio, <coughs> excuse me, was favorable. <laughs> and um, I think that's obvious to people from a patient care perspective, but um, the IRB actually also looks at your research design in terms of whether or not it will answer the question that you're asking. Um, and they, uh, they look at that also because they don't want you subjecting patients to, to procedures or even evaluations if they're just, if they're frivolous, you know, if they're, if they're not related to, to the question at hand. <clears throat> So again, your project might be, um, might be considered either a minimal risk to a high risk, but nonetheless, if, you know, if the potential benefits to society, to, to patients in, in the future uh, justify it, that's okay. Um, again, I guess I just said that. <coughs> Selection of subjects is equitable as something else that we'd look at. Um, to just ensure that your protocol isn't biased and not going to give you results that are um, generalizable to a larger patient population. Informed consent is a big one. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, but not just obtaining it, but documenting it. In research, a lot of these regulations are similar to quality assurance, um, which is done in, in manufacturing, in, in labs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And it's basically, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Um, you might have consent, a patient's consent, but if it's not documented and you can't prove that you had that consent, that's not going to help you a whole lot. Um, the IRB does have uh, situations where you can obtain verbal consent from patients, but then, of course, there's a process for documenting that, yes, in fact, I did obtain verbal consent from the patient on this particular day. Um, monitoring the data. Um, the, the most obvious thing uh, that you're looking for are any bad experiences that patients have during your research project and reporting that. I think one of the things that, that I value most within my, our group um, of our research office as well as at Moran is that we really do strive for transparency. Um, it's always worse to not report something than to, to say, you know, this happened and just put it out there and you deal with it and you manage it appropriately. Um, it's always 10 times worse when you're down the road and someone comes back and say, well, you had this event you know, back here and it wasn't reported, but yet you continued um, as if it didn't happen. Um, and so oftentimes it just requires modifying the way you're doing your study a little bit, or maybe not. But nonetheless, um, it's sort of like that you know, old adage, there's no stupid question, it's just not asking a question. It's the same thing, I mean, reporting anything that happens with your project. Even, I mean, if it's a, not, oh, I've lost the consent forms, 
document it. I mean, so th it just shows that you're that you're really doing a good job of trying to to do things appropriately, do your research appropriately. Um, protecting the privacy of subjects, maintaining confidentiality of data. Um, in these days of, of HIPAA, I think we're all familiar with that. <laughs> um, the uh, the vulnerable patient populations, I mentioned. And then for the consent document itself, it looks a little daunting, but these are the, the types of things that are generally covered in a consent and required to be covered. Um, the rationale, the background of why you're doing this project, what is the purpose, what is specifically the research question you're trying to answer, what procedures are patients, should be patients be expected that they will um, undergo. And even if it's, you know, you're, you're obtaining data from their standard care, you know, you want to tell them that. We're going to be obtaining data from your eye exams. Um, and then in the consent form, you know, we, we, we uh, highlight specifically what is done for their standard care versus what is experimental or research um, in phase three trials. You collect a lot more information that is primarily safety information than you would in clinic. You know, you're seeing patients more frequently than you would in clinic probably. And so, you know, we let patients know, you know, before they even enter the study, you'd only have to come in once every three months if you were seeing your doctor for this condition, but we're going to want to see you every month. That impacts whether or not they can participate, but they know up front that it's going to require a little extra effort on their part, for example. Um, what, all, what are the risks and the benefits of, of, your, of your project? Are there alternatives for patients? Um, you know, is there an approved, is there approved therapy or isn't there? confidentiality, voluntary participation, and then we give them information on the doctor's phone number and who they can contact at the university if they're concerned about the way the research is being conducted. Um, oh, okay. Um, there are other things, depending on the, um, the, the magnitude of your research project that you would include in a consent document. Um, but again, the IRB website has a template that gives you all of these headings on there, and you can just decide whether these things are applicable to your project or not. Um, one thing, when you do, not only does a patient um, have a voluntary choice to whether or not to participate in a research project, they can withdraw from a research project at any time without any consequence to them. Um, I think obviously there are situations where it's not in a be patient's best interest to withdraw from a study um, because of the increased surveillance that often goes along with the research. Uh, when you're studying a new drug that's maybe not quite as um, uh, significant because you would probably stop the investigational drug, but when you're doing an IOL study um, or any other type of implant, you could imagine that implant is intended to stay in that patient just because that patient says, I don't feel like coming in for follow-ups any longer, doesn't mean you're going to take the lens out or, you know, the knee implant or whatever. I mean, they still have what is essentially an unapproved, you know, device implanted in their body. I mean, so it really is in their best interest for them to stay in the study. But nonetheless, you know, you can't require them to do that. All you can do is give them all the information um, and, uh, what the consequences may be of, of withdrawing. Um, as you're doing a research project, if you learn some new information, again, if it's about a drug or a device in particular, but um, say those adverse events that we're seeing in the, in the, in the project um, are, sh are telling you there's some concerns with maybe you know, using this product on a specific subpopulation of patients or something, um, you're required to tell patients that, you know, if you have significant enough findings, um, they need to know and they may need to reconsider whether or not they want to consider in that project, you know, continue in that project. Um, and we've had, you know, we've seen situations in, in clinical trials where um, the information is significant enough that the IRB will require you to reconsent patients just to document the fact that you've shared this information with them and they've agreed to continue nonetheless. Okay, there are some other situations where that full consent is not required. Um, however, uh, there, are, there are options where you can have a waiver of consent or a verbal consent. A lot of um, our residents and students do questionnaires with patients. Um, if you are sending a questionnaire, you have a little cover letter explaining what you're doing and um, 
send a questionnaire or have the patients call you to complete a questionnaire. The fact that they are agreeing to answer those questions implies that they're consenting um, to participate in your research, but nonetheless, the IRB will want to see that cover letter and the questionnaire up front th that shows that you are explaining to patients what it is, you know, what you're researching. Um, and a whole other set of issues when you're dealing with minors. Um, we get into assent for children who um, typically between the ages of 7 or 17, but generally the who you feel are able to uh, agree to participate of their own accord. Um, and, and that's actually uh, pediatric clinical research over the last couple of decades has become um, much more um, heavily uh, scrutinized um, because if you could imagine a lot of that off-label use which is still out there but involved using um, medications in in children that were not studied in children and the reason that uh, they probably weren't studied in children because that's a real vulnerable group, right? It's a real risky group. You know, when you've got human, little human beings developing and you're going to throw an investigational drug at them, you know, what kind of consequences is that going to have long term? But um, eventually the FDA realized in their wisdom that that really probably wasn't in their benefit in the long run. But nonetheless, unless a um, minor has a situation where they need an investigational treatment to sustain their life or to retain their vision, for example, they actually do have to agree that they're going to be you know, willing to participate in the study, even if they don't understand. The, the parents still have to consent, but the children have to assent that they're willing to, willing to participate. Um, for um, Patients are required to have a consent form in their native language, so, and there is a translation service on campus that will, for a very reasonable price, translate consent forms for us. Um, and for us in, you know, in ophthalmology, uh, visual impairment is an issue with reading a consent document, right? So we'll either make our consents in a large font so that visually impaired people can read it, or you may have to have a section in there where you're allowing someone to read the consent to the patient and, um, and signing that they witnessed the process and that the entire form was read to the patient. In our um, investigator-initiated projects, um, where we may not have a professional clinical research coordinator helping you with them, we've just added this little um, four check boxes to the uh, consent form to really to help you or the staff, whoever is helping you, you know, with um, recruiting patients for your study, kind of as just a reminder that you've really conducted the, the, ins, the consent process, not just here's the consent form, you know, sign it and we'll take these other pictures, um, which really does happen quite a bit, um, but you actually had a conversation with the patient about what the research is, why you're doing it, what they have to undergo, and you really should be asking them, do you have any questions about the research? Um, and so these little check boxes that we've added, just as a reminder, to say that you know, you've reviewed um, the nature of the research, you've given the patient time to consider it, ask them any questions, and answer them if they had them. And finally, the patient should go home with a copy of that signed consent form, so they have that for future reference. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> Excuse me. I know you're all familiar with HIPAA from a healthcare setting, um, but any research, HIPAA also, when that law was enacted, um, required that any research involving protected health information be reviewed by a privacy board. Um, how other organizations handle that, I'm not sure, but here at the University of Utah, the IRB does act as the privacy board for uh, research with PHI. Um, and then, um, as you're familiar with authorizations as well, um, in clinical practice, authorizing to disclose a patient's um, PHI for some reason, whether it's to their insurance company, um, to a, a referring physician, whatever, that applies to research as well. So actually, the consent form is um, a consent and authorization document usually because there's another page tacked on to the end of that consent, which is just about the authorization telling the patient what information we're going to be collecting about them, what we're going to do with it, who we might show it to, who we might share it with, who we won't. Um, as you know, there are 18 um, patient identifiers defined by HIPAA. 
Um, a lot of investigators nonetheless still feel that if you don't have a patient's name on the data, then it's de-identified and um, not necessarily, you know, if you've got their date of birth, if you have their dates of their, uh, that you've seen them in clinic, their dates of service, something like that. So um, you may be in a situation where you think you've got, oh, I've got de-identified data, I can just share this. Well, it may be a limited data set rather than de-identified data, and that's another area of, a, um, of regulation. And so, as I mentioned, we're, re we're obtaining authorization from research participants, not just consent for the research. Um, and um, if you do have a, a de-identified data set or a limited data set, and you're doing collaborative research with uh, investigators at other institutions, there may be some agreements that you'd want to put into place um, institution to institution. And the IRB and, and our you know, regulatory office can help you figure out which of those you need as well. Uh, there are some types of research besides those things which I said were not research, like case report forms, like um, you know, off-label use, there are things that are research, but they're considered exempt because they are so low risk. Um, and f that, that list um, fortunately has been growing as the uh, federal regulations evolve and they realize that, that IRBs are just overburdened by a lot of research that, that is much safer, much less risky than the amount of effort that's going into regulating them. And um, fortunately for, for residents, because you all do a lot of these things, are um, retrospective case reviews. Um, so uh, not, uh, not, a, not a case study, but you know, a case series of all of the patients who have a certain type of IOL in their eye or something. Um, but if you're just looking at retrospect, retrospective records um, that could potentially be exempt from full IRB approval, the catch-22 is you have to submit an application to the IRB for them to tell you that it's, that it's exempt. Um, but nonetheless, I think that application helps you structure your research. As I said, it is a Q&A process. Um, it helps you develop exactly what your, what your hypothesis is and how you're going to test it, specifically what patient records you might be looking at, you know, really define it more than you might otherwise have. Um, and, um, you know, normal educational practices um, are exempt. Collection of a blood sample might be exempt if a patient is having a blood draw um, as part of their normal care and you want a, a sample of that, um, that might be considered exempt. But I think now that actually the regulations are becoming, um, going the other direction when it comes to bio samples, um, especially because of all the genetic research that people are doing, obviously. Um, and, and, and kind of the, uh, the regulatory climate is now considering that a, a, a bio sample, you know, from a genetic perspective, can never really be truly de-identified. Um, and so, you know, this, I'm just getting another blood sample when, you know, the baby's having a heel stick for something is considered minimal risk, but may still require full regulation by an IRB. Um, this is what my office looks like. Um, as I mentioned, we have five research coordinators, um, a technician who is trained in a lot of specific um, programs or visual acuity, you know, ETDRS visual acuity is a standardized research procedure as opposed to the Snellen charts, um, visual fields, different, different, um, different measures that um, are more, have become more standardized in research settings than they are in the clinic. So she can help you with that. Um, actually here at Moran, the genetic counselor falls under clinical research, although she's certainly seeing patients in the clinic. Um, but, you know, we're, I'm, I'm anticipating that um, the state of genetics in the clinic is in, in ophthalmology is certainly going to catch up to where it is now, say, in, you know, cancer treatment, for example, where you've got treatment decisions based on, on genotyping. I mean, obviously we have that right now with retinoblastoma, for example, but um, it's not as big a thing in ophthalmology, obviously, as it is in certain other areas, but that's gonna change. Um, but right now, you know, we're enrolling um, studies that are looking at patients with specific genotypes. So we are doing genetic testing on patients. Brianna can help you um, pre-authorize testing, you know, with labs. She's got relationships with, with certain labs across the country. Um, and obviously talk to patients about um, their condition from, you know, what the genetic information is about their condition and then when results come back specifically explain those results to them.
and our regulatory coordinator Elizabeth is is absolutely key in all of the IRB applications as well as um, implementation uh, questions that come up along the way. <clears throat> and I think that was it in a in a nutshell, a quick summary of I hope you know why we what we do in clinical research and why. Um, any questions or general or specific? Uh, no. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for being here so early, and definitely you know come by our office or give me a call. Um, even if you're thinking about you know you haven't decided you're going to pursue something yet, but I've got this idea, and you know we're always happy to give our opinion and offer guidance. Okay. All right, thanks.